Thank you for coming. My name is Natalie Cook. I'm Associate Dean at the Library of here. Um, before beginning, I'd like to acknowledge that McGill University is located on land that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst the indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabeg nations. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the land on which we meet today. And I'm delighted to welcome you here to our space. Um, I'm Associate Dean of Moore, which is a, a group of four different units. Rare Books of Special Collections, which is where you're sitting at the moment. The Oster Library of the History of Medicine. Archives and Records Management. And also the Visual Arts Collection. I'd also like to take this moment um, to thank in particular two people who are in the audience at the moment. Ron Harvey and Doug Bagley. Can you just give us a little wave? <laughs> Their generosity and thoughtfulness has supported a number of initiatives in the library and actually has made possible the programming for the full year because we use the, their donation as cash allocation so as to apply for a shirt grant. And so we've, um, we've been able to actually triple the, their donation, and it's, it's been enormously helpful. Um, they are such fans of Judith and Donna that they actually drove for two hours from Prescott, Ontario. <laughs> 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 Um, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Library as well for their collaboration. They also um, helped us to purchase the wonderful Mystery Dream theme <laughs> cookies that you've been enjoying. So thank you to the Friends. Um, there's a few housekeeping notes. We're going to have a Q&A session after the conversation, so please hold your questions. Um, John, Donna and Judith's books will be sold after the event by Paragraph. I noticed that a lot of you have actually been purchasing them already. And they will be signing the books. So they'll be doing that up here on the tables after the event. And without further ado, I would actually like to turn the mic over to able rare books librarian, Ellis Ng, who's going to briefly introduce the mysteries of and the mysteries in our collection. So to Ellis. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, my name is Ella Singh. I am fortunate enough to be a, libra a librarian here within the Rare Books and Special Collections team. Uh, my role for tonight is to spend just a moment or two telling you a bit about some of the collections and material held here that relates to tonight's talk. Uh, in the absence of my lovely colleague Lonnie, Lonnie Weatherby, who helped organize this event, and is on a very well-deserved vacation right now, I'll also be briefly mentioning his area, which is the Humanities and Social Sciences Library, with whom we share this building. Uh, I'm going to come back to this point at the end, but I'll just say it now as well. The McGill Library is not for McGill people only. Please know this. Um, the material I'll be telling you about from rare books and special collections, for example, uh, is available to everyone here in our reading room. Whether you're researching something for publication, or whether you just want to spend time with something beautiful and fascinating um, from our collections, which truly span the globe and the centuries, all are welcome here. Please know this. Now, let me start by telling you about the wonderful works written by our two very special guests, and which you will find in the Humanities and Social Sciences Library. To be perfectly frank with you, I had hoped that I would be able to check out a book or two so that I could read or reread, in some cases, some books to help me prepare for tonight. But, wouldn't you know it, they are extremely popular and they were all checked out. Um, My Venice and Other Essays by Donna Leon, checked out. Uh, Aqua Alta by Donna, checked out. Beastly Things, also by Donna, checked out. By its cover, which I am most keen to read, touching as it does on the weird and wonderful world of rare books libraries. Um, I am most keen to read this, but again, checked out. And Judith Flanders, whose nonfiction books about the Victorian period I have wholeheartedly recommended to a number of people wanting some context for the 19th century material that we hold here. Judith's works have also proven extremely popular around campus. 
consuming passions, leisure and pleasure in Victorian Britain, checked out. The Victorian city, everyday life in Dickens, London, checked out. The making of a home, checked out. Her works of fiction are also highly in demand. The invention of murder, checked out. A task of vultures, checked out. Uh, I think you get the picture. <laughs> so yes, the library holds quite a few works um, by our wonderful guests, and not just the ones that I mentioned. There is more in the Commissario Guido Bernetti series, as well as the Sam Clair series, both of which we'll be hearing more about tonight from their creators. Up here on the fourth floor, in Rare Books and Special Collections, you'll get to meet some of the Quebecois colleagues of Guido Bernetti and Sam Clair, amongst our considerable collection of mid-century detective fiction. This includes the detective Albert Briand, created by Pierre Daigneault, as well as Guy, Guy Vercher and Domino Noir, both created by Paul Vercher. Staying on the fourth floor, you'll also find a wealth of Victorian era material, just the sort that Judith does such an amazing job of contextualizing and explaining in her nonfiction works. In addition to published works by people like Charles Dickens, Robert Louis Stevenson, and Arthur Conan Doyle, we have Victorian era toy theaters and puppets in the Punch and Judy tradition. There are Victorian cookbooks in which one can find a recipe for jellied just about everything. Because everything was jellied back in those days. So I uh, in the Black and Wood Natural History Collection, you'll find works by the 19th century writer Richard Jeffries, who shared some of Donna's environmental concerns and wrote a book called After London, which according to many scholars is one of the very first examples of post-apocalyptic uh, fiction and was based on his concerns about humans increasing disconnect with the natural world. Now, to go back to my starting point, to wrap up, all of this material and so, so much more is available to you here on the fourth floor. Some of the material I've mentioned has been digitized, and that's one way in to our collections. Um, but here in our reading room, you can also sign up for what we call a consultation card. Consultation cards are free. There is no cost associated with these and anyone is free to do so. You need not have any kind of particular affiliation or even purpose. Um, you just need to come here and have a curious uh, curiosity. That's all we ask. Um, we are not here on the fourth floor a borrowing library, so with apologies, you cannot take our medieval manuscripts home with you, but we do work incredibly hard to make our collections as accessible as we possibly can. Um, so on that note, I will wrap up. If you have any questions about our collections or anything I've mentioned, please come find me afterwards or come in any time during our opening hours um, and ask any one of my wonderful colleagues. It will be our great, great pleasure to welcome you all here. Um, and now I will pass over to another one of my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Victoria Dickinson, who is going to be introducing our wonderful speakers. Thank you both for being here tonight. <laughs> We're putting our displays together right now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ellis. <laughs> well, thank you, Ellis. Um, and I have to say, I checked out digital Donnelly on online. You couldn't get those either. <laughs> so I had the opportunity to read them on my iPad, and I was absolutely delighted. So I am not a librarian, but I'm an adjunct professor here in Rare Books at McGill, and this is a great treat for me. I'm delighted to present you the Flanders in conversation with Donna Leon on the newest book, Trace Elements. It was coming in a cup. Hold, hold. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the latest in the Commissaire Guido Bonetti series. Up front, I am a fan of Donna Leon ever since an esteemed conductor was murdered at La Vinci in 1902. <laughs> and I met. That's when I first met the thoughtful inspector, his charming wife and family, and of course his circle of friends and his uh, colleagues. And of course I got to learn much more about Venice and much more about the wonderful cuisine of Italy, which has inspired me ever since. So I mentioned tuna in tomato sauce, it's on my list. <laughs> they did that recently. So, Donna Leon is the author not just of uh, one or two books, but of 29 books. And then this is an internationally best-selling uh, series of a Guido Brunetti. She's the winner of the CWA Macallan Silver Dagger for Fiction and the Golden Book Award, among others. The series has been named one of Time Magazine's six detective series to savor. And if you 
read the series and you understand about the food element in it, you know the savouring is makes your mouth water when you read it. She's also been chosen one of Times London's 50 greatest crime writers, so well deserved, and currently resides in Venice and divides her time between Venice and Switzerland. Judith Flanders is also a mystery writer. It's wonderful. It's you know, embarrassment of riches. She's the author of the Samantha or Sam Clare mystery novels, as well as a number of nonfiction books, and Ellis mentioned The Invention of Murder, how Victorians reveled in death and detection and created modern crime. This was a New York Times bestseller, shortlisted for the CWA Nonfiction Dagger Award. Her other books have been shortlisted for the Guardian First Book Award, as well as the British Book Awards History Book of the Year. Judith's most recent book, <laughs> is a I actually we should go with cloth pockets. <laughs> Judith's most recent book is a place for everything. The curious history of alphabetical order, which is a perfect book for a library. She spent her childhood here in Montreal, but she currently resides in London. So it's wonderful to have you here, and I look forward to hearing more about death and murder. <laughs> Secret book of questions, you know that. Um, I think because I mean, Donna and I have sort of got into a rhythm of this. Donna comes to London once a year when there's a new book out, and we sit in this bookstore, and all these nice people arrive to listen. And I am absolutely convinced we've been doing it for about eight, ten years, maybe. And I'm absolutely convinced it's the same people. <laughs> <laughs> it's really scary because I. I <laughs> trying to think of new questions. And today I said to Tom, we could ask the old question. Yeah, <laughs> we don't know the old question. Good. So, so long. The old questions. Let's go back to the old questions, which is basically, this series has been running for 26 books now. 29 books I combined. How did you start? How did it come to happen? I was in the dressing room of Teatro La Fenice with Gabriele Ferro, an old old friend of mine. He's a Sicilian conductor. He's really a bel canto conductor. And his wife, during a rehearsal for La Favorite by Donizetti, starring those of you who are opera crazies, uh, Shirley Verrett, one of the great American singers of the last century. And as Jaya and Gabriele and I sat and chatted, the name of another conductor was introduced to the conversation. And I noticed a certain chill fill the room <laughs> on their parts. And we started talking, and they're both Sicilian. So there was an escalation. So we, we ended up talking about how we could kill him in the room. <laughs> <laughs> And I was then a professor of English literature, minding my own business, or what Flannery O'Connor would call my business. And I thought, wow, that would be a great crime book. I wonder if I could write a murder mystery. And I, I reflected upon my misspent years as a graduate student and as a teaching assistant at the University of Massachusetts. <coughs> When I, I didn't have a television, so after putting in a day in the trenches, either as a professor or as a student, I would go home and read murder mysteries. Because after a day of that, you just, you're, you're not really capable of, of deep thought or thought. And I realized that in my too many years in graduate school, I read hundreds, hundreds of murder mysteries. How long does it take you to read one, really? <laughs> Maybe, maybe you can get through it two days if you're working and, and are diligent about reading. So the, the formula of crime fiction had been, while I wasn't paying attention, had been incised into my brain, that which was left after a day of Henry James and Jane Austen. And so when I started to write the book, I knew the tropes, I, I knew the patterns that <coughs> Many, many writers, good ones and, and mediocre ones, had <coughs> used in their books. And so I thought, well, you need a crime, you need, you need, you need. 
a cop or a detective or someone or a lawyer. It has to be an interesting figure. You need clues. You need uh, colleagues around the, the investigator. And you need a solution to the crime. How hard could that be? <laughs> so I, and I, I, had no, I had no idea how long this would take because I'd never, I'd never written anything except maybe a, a, a master's thesis. But I had the good sense to realize that I was going to be with this person. And because it was in Italy, he had to be a man. Because of 30 years ago, there were far fewer people, far fewer women working on the police, or in fact working in positions of authority, far fewer than there are now. And so he became a commissario di polizia. And then I thought, common sense, he would be, if he's at that rank, He'd be probably this old, which is never revealed in <coughs> heaven in the book, the books. And he would probably be married. Most of us meet our first sweetie, serious sweetie, at university. He would have been, he would have earned a degree probably in law to become a, a police investigator in the commissariat. And so all of that, that he'd be married, he'd probably have two kids. All of that stuff, the packaging of the person, was predetermined by his profession. I couldn't do that with a private detective because they could come from anywhere. But he would have to have followed a certain path. And then, then I just followed, I followed the footsteps in the snow. That there's a crime, it's an important crime. You start investigating, you start asking questions, you ask questions. And you have to have the skill to ask questions. I also had the good sense of, at the time to give him a connecting links to various strata of society. He is a man of the people, and so he has the, the, the loaders of both, the unloader of both, the gondolieri, the trasportatori. He knows them. But I gave him a wife whose father is one of the richest men in, in Venice and a count. He's an aristocrat. So by doing that, Brunetti has access to these people on the, on the, lower, the lower half of society, but he also has access, because of his connections, because in Italy, as it has everywhere, his connections will help you. Who help you get information, who help you get favors, who help you call in their favors, because society works like this. And so all of that was, was a given when I started to write the book. And so the, 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 the mystery part of the book was relatively easy. He, had to, he just had to find out who done it. And with the aid of his connections, he found out who done it. And I realized that I, I had an enormous amount of fun. Then the book sat in the drawer for more than a year because all I wanted to do was see if I could write a murder mystery. I did that, so I put it in a drawer and I just forgot, I forgot about it. A, a friend nagged me into sending it to a competition in Japan. So I sent it to Japan and forgot about it. Six months later came at one of those, remember the old airmail letters? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Earlier days when you could get them. And it said that I, I who the hell went to Japan? And it was to invite me to the competition in Japan. So I said, yeah, hey, a trip to Japan, I'll go. So I went my way. And then I found an agent and he got the book published. And the book came with the, the publication contract was for two books. So I said, oh, good, I can write another one. Because the first one was so much fun. And then I got another contract, and it's, it's been like that. Yeah, I get a contract. I get a contract each time. I think I get a contract every time. I don't believe in anyone. And, um, it's springtime, so yeah, there's something in the mail. And I, I still continue to have a glorious amount of fun with them. Because at this point in my uh, fun word career, there's no reason not to do it unless it's fun. And I have, I have, I like, I like the funny bits. And Judith has the patience of Saint Anselmo or someone, because I send Judith the funny bits. Never anything that has to do with the investigation or the, the crime or none of, none of those nasty bloody bits. Just the funny things that I think, well, at least that I think Wait, funny. When I got the new book, I was reading the new book, and all of a sudden I thought, who 
who am I going to tell him and how am I going to tell him that Donna's lost it? <laughs> I read this before. It was in a previous book. And then, oh, thank God, it wasn't in a previous book. She just sent it to me. <laughs> but there was a real moment of panic where I thought you had actually lifted a whole scene from the previous book. I'm completely but I have a very good, I have an editor who is a tiger shark in Zurich. She's reading the books in her third language, because her native language is German, and next came Spanish, and then came English, and then came Russian. She speaks, like most Swiss people, she speaks. She's omnilingual. But she manages to find everything. Once she found the table, the meant she went to lunch three times. <laughs> but she's learned to be very gentle with me. She said, Donna, I know that Italians like to eat. <laughs> and then another time she, she found, my, my characters are always having sex chain operations because they start out as somebody's brother and they end up as somebody's sister. <laughs> and they change. There are all sorts of incestuous relationships when cousins get married. And, but Christine is on the case because she, she pays very, very close attention. Also, to excuse my, my own slovenly habits, when you've been like this with something for six, seven, eight months, it is very easy to overlook something. Even, even though it is the ninth time you've read the passage, you forget that 200 pages ago, his eyes were blue. <laughs> and since she reads them for the first time, she finds all of that stuff. But she finds far more important things. In, in this book, uh, Trey Sullivan's. <laughs> no, no, I'm not pretending. <laughs> so I say the one about the, the, the animals, or the one about the drug smuggling, or the one about the trafficking women, or the one about the animals. In this book, there's lots of chemical stuff because it's about stuff, about chemical things. So I would write, it had to be 0 .003. Never trust me. If there's more than two letters, two, if there's more than two numbers in a number, no matter where the decimal places are, do not trust me. Don't ask me to read the prescription for you and say, no, it says that you should take three drops in a glass of water because it's going to be 30 drops, you'll tell you. I, I can't do it here, but I get these very complicated emails from her saying, Donna, the percentage of mercury, the percentage of molybdenum, the percentage of copper that can... So she said it all straight, and now the book is, is clean. Okay, so we know that to begin, if you want to be a crime novelist, then you have to sit in backstage at La Fenice <laughs> with a Sicilian who wants to start that okay. But how did you get to La Fenice? How did you end up in Venice? Because I think it is pretty clear so far that Donna is not Italian. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not, I'm not Italian. I'm, of my grandparents, I'm Spanish, German, Irish, Irish. Like most Americans, I am the children of immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> and my last name was De Leon, a Hispanic name. I think I had ancestors in Mexico. <laughs> anyway, um, I was an academic, and then I didn't like it anymore. I didn't like graduate school anymore. So I took a job in Iran. And I went to Iran, and I, in essence, I played tennis for four years, which was great. But I was supposed to be working for one of the companies that was getting all of the, the, the dollars back from the Iranians, because we buy their oil, and the dollars would go to Iran, and then we wanted to get the, the, the dollars back in America, so we'd sell them helicopters and F-16s and pilots, and, the, and then all the money came back. And I had, I had a glorious time. I, I had a job, but nobody really took it. Seriously. So I played tennis all day long. And then, then there was a revolution and we were evacuated. So I went back to the States and I thought, oh, I don't want to go back to So I went to China for a year to teach. That was, that was, that was fun. And then I went back from China. And I don't think I want to go back to graduate school. Oh, the reason I didn't want to go back to graduate school was that 
<laughs> when we were evacuated, I had worked on my dissertation when I was in Iran. The Changing Moral Order in the Universe of Jane Austen's Novels. Can you believe? <laughs> and they warned us when we were about to be evacuated that the Iranians were confiscating all printed material. Oh. So I, I will outwit them. So I put the rough draft of the dissertation, all of the annotated books, in, different, in three different trunks, and two copies Two Xerox copies. I didn't care. No, they, they told us that everything was being confiscated at the airport. Put everything in your luggage, in your trunks. So I put them there. I didn't take any books, anything. And of course, they didn't even look at us at the open just Then everything came back after six months, all of our trunks for all of us who worked for this company. Everything came except anything that was on paper. All books, all manuscripts, all rough drafts of dissertations were confiscated. So I was left, after four years in Iran, with the prospect of going back to graduate school. After having had a guy point a, a, a Kalashnikov at my nose from about three inches up, <laughs> graduate school didn't have the same allure. <laughs> so I said, oh, hell, I'll go to China. And then I came back from China. And because in China, I was paid ten times more than my colleagues. It didn't seem right to me because China was such a poor country. Mm. <laughs> Don't ask me for financial advice. It didn't seem right as a member of the wealthy American culture to take money out of this poor country, China. So every payday, I, bought, I spent it all. I blew it all on silk and mailed it to <coughs> in the States. So when I left China, it was as if I hadn't worked for a year because I had given all, I had spent all of my salary. So I got back to the States. Please. So temptation, temptation came in the form of a job offer in Saudi Arabia. And my conscience, my good sense, my experience, my wisdom, my will, my everything said, don't do it. Everyone I knew said, don't do it. So I went. Because <laughs> I was offered an embarrassing amount of money. So I went to Saudi Arabia. And for the only time in my life, I was unhappy for nine months. Because it was the most unpleasant, disgusting, horrible experience I've ever had. But they confiscate your passport when you go in so you can't get out. So after nine months, I, I said, all right, that's it. No more academic mercenary. No more of that. Go to where you've always loved where you always, where you know lots of people that you love and that you like. Because I had been on and off, I had made friends in Italy 20 years before that. So I, I went to Italy, I went to Venice, and I got a job. So I was employed in English, and I could live in Italian. And I love opera, and I still love opera, and I'm, now I've, I've worked in the opera world for about 20 years. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And I got lucky. And I think that's why I'm, I'm pretty cavalier about the whole thing, because I was lucky. It's just, it's luck. The books are good, but there are lots of good kind of books. Um, and it's fun. But I just, it's not anything I ever planned. It's not ever anything I wanted. I had, as you can see from my life story, I, I have absolutely, I never had any ambition to be in <coughs> except happy. Maybe that's why I, I still hate that. I still hate the Saudis. Men, so much. I have no hesitation in being absolutely public about it. I think it's hell, hell on earth, as they repeatedly prove, time and time again. Um, so I just want, I just want to have a lot of fun, and I do. Mainly because of the music. Yes. It, it's interesting because I think you're right. I don't think anyone ever grows up to say I want to be a crime writer when I grow up, mommy. But it's interesting because crime fiction can do things that higher literature, literature can tell in more is you. When you say that when you're at graduate school, you know, basically crime fiction is your television. Mm -hmm. It's your way of relaxing. But it's also, as we see from your series, from series set in different parts of the world, it's also a way of finding the window. <coughs> Into yeah. other worlds. Yeah, this is this is an Anglo-Saxon's view of Italy, and an Anglo-Saxon view of of Venice. I like to think that it, it is not only an informed view, but a loving view. By the when I read 
when I wrote the book, I had been going, the first book, I had been going to Italy since 1968. I wrote the book in 1990-something. And I had been living there permanently for more than 10 years. But living with Italians and in Italian, because I knew no English speakers in the city then, because there weren't so many. And so I lived, not, certainly not as an Italian, but um, with them and close to them, because my, my friend Viva, who wrote the, the cookbook, is my sister, and her 96-year-old mother is my second mother. And I have those obligations. I have to email them every day, or call them every day to let them know that I'm still safe. Now, not only when I'm here, when I'm in Switzerland, I have to tell them I'm safe. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, I have that also, I, I think that we, we could break in here with one secret that I think might upset Victoria, but um, the food element in these books is so all due to, to confess. Yeah. They're all, it's all due to Biba. The, after about 20 books, the German, the so many people wrote to Diogenes, my publisher, and said, Is there any book So I, I told them that I, I wouldn't write a cookbook, but if they would give the job to my friend Biba, at whose table I have eaten 17,000 times, they would make a good deal because she's a great cook. And I'd write bits and pieces about Italian food. I, I wanted to be honest with them because I, don't, I couldn't write a cookbook if my life depended on it. But Biba could. And, and, it, and there are in manuscript, in the manuscripts I've seen that it says, and Paola went to the market, and since it was May, she bought X, X, yeah, X. Yeah, I just do this. <laughs> Ciao, Biba. Si, so me. Senti, siamo in maggio. Eh, si, ciao. Dimmi cosa si mangia. No, 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 per cena. And Biba will tell me what in May the nations would eat for dinner. <laughs> Because I don't know, but she does. One thing that, that surprised me, I, I confess that it surprised me, when Diogenes had one of their sweet young things go through the books to find the food parts, I thought there would be food porn. But instead, there's very little actually said about what is eaten. The food is named, the wine might be named, but I don't do any product placement, so it's just, <laughs> <laughs> just some, you know, you know melo, um, cabernet bianco. And the food is named, and someone says, isn't this good, or someone's, the, but there's, no, there's none of that. Because <sighs> I don't really like that. But many people were suckered into the same belief that that I had been suckered into, having written these brief references to food, almost footnote references to food, people somehow convey pleasure and peace and harmony to those food scenes. And it's because of the family, not because of what they're eating. Because you don't know very often, you don't know what they're eating. You don't know what it tastes like. You might know its name. But there's no loving description of food. And that surprised me. For the last two years, we've been doing the, the second cook. Biba has all the recipes done, and I've been fooling around and not writing things I have to write. But next year or the year after, there should be another, another cookbook. It's interesting that you say that they sit around as a family, because I think one of the... I, I think there are two elements in series that become very interesting. One is what I what I call the sort of tourist postcard thing on, you know, this is the city you're in, this is the culture you're in. But the other one is what, what I refer to as the soap opera element, which is getting to know a cast of characters mm -hmm. very well. I, I, I told on that um, last night that years ago, her then editor said to me, her new manuscript had just come in, and he would send it over to me to read. And it was great because Raffi has a girlfriend. <laughs> and I said, well, of course Raffi has a girlfriend. He's been going out with Sarah Patanucci for ages. <laughs> <laughs> and we realized we were talking about them as though they're real people who we know. And it's the pleasure of a recurring series. So I think you know, what, what you said at the very beginning, that uh, 
you were smart enough to know, even if you thought it was only for one vote, not for three. Yeah, nine. thank God. Uh, mm -hmm. Not to have, you know, in, in, in classic um, cry noir things, you know, some drunken loner who, who ends up, you know, falling off the couch at three in the morning. Oh, how could they bear to live with him all this time? I mean, not 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 the people who do it, but the authors who did not deal with this. Um, you know, I mean, Bernanke is an mixed person, and he has a nice family. But yes. most people do. I just I just assume that this is a this is a a form of family life that is repeated. In many, I won't say most places because I don't know, but in many places, people live, chuckle on happily together and, and like one another and love one another. And I will confess, I must conf in, in this parlous age, I must confess that I had a happy childhood. <laughs> I was, we were a happy family. We laughed, we made jokes, we terrible. Can I tell you a little bit story? Can I stop her? <laughs> I was in an elevator in uh, New York. One of those ones where you have you have to have a ticket to, to bing, and then you can push your floor. So a bunch of people get got in, and they were handing their cards back and forth. Uh, when you push sixteen, I'm I'm twenty seven, and the the last one, a woman here, handed the card over to someone and said, "I'm seven. And I looked at her and I said, you look much older. <laughs> but I get drunk when I am in, I realize that I get drunk because people understand English. It's their first language. In Venice, I know three people who are native speakers of English. I speak English, my, my mother tongue, with three people in the city where I live for thir more than 30 years. Because I speak Italian most of the time. And then when I move out of Italy, I'm speaking to people whose native tongue is not English. So when I'm in a society where people speak English and have that immediate response to silly remarks, I get crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun. Yeah. Nobody on the elevator left. <laughs> Okay, well that wasn't the media response. <laughs> Another time, this is from years ago, in New York. Um, I was on an elevator, facing forward, the doors open, and as you know, elevator etiquette is that you say your last words outside the elevator, you step into the elevator, and you don't say anything until the elevator is on the bottom floor. So two guys are standing out there, and someone's, but one of the guys said something, and the other one said, holy cow, they got on the elevator, and I said, only in India. <laughs> Bang on the door, 
and tell him that he's, he's spent too much time in the shower and he's using too much hot water. And it's treated as a joke. And then maybe 10 or 12 years later, Signorina Eletra has imposed on everybody in the Questura the three garbage things. Paper, waste, plastic. And everybody does it because they tremble in fear of what would happen if they didn't. But still, it was sort of lighthearted. And in the last couple of books, there's no more jokes. The books are about the environment. The books are about the environmental disaster in Act in Italy. And so this book, which started, this book was, it's, it, it's a way it's a joker book. If you read the first 50 pages, you find out about a possible crime, a possible murder. But it's only possible. Because Brunetti has to speculate on the possible cause of this ac accident. This accident. So the first 50 pages of the book lead up to a scene or a situation that could go anywhere. If that person had been killed, had been murdered intentionally, the, the book suggests no possible motive for 50 pages. The book doesn't even tell you if it's a crime for 50 pages. So up at that point, I was free to take the book anywhere. And I was planning to write the book about another kind of crime. But as I got to that point, I thought, that's, that's what I can do. That's what this book wants to do. And so the book just, from that, maybe 50 pages of manuscript, I don't remember where it is, but it just goes, and he's off like a ferret after the environment again. The, the book, I'm, ne I'm almost finished with the next one. I have about um, 60 or 70 pages of manuscript to write for, for number 30. And it is not yet an environmental book. <laughs> but no, it's too late. It's not going to be an environmental book. But I realize that the, the subject has, has grabbed me. I talked to Richard Powers, who's an old friend of mine, and I was talking to him giving a lecture in Zurich after the Pulitzer. And I said, Richard, I'm writing this book, this book, and I think it's going to be an ecological book, and I don't want to be the old lady in the corner screaming about the ecology. I don't, should I continue to write books about the, about the environment? And he thought for a moment in his, his Richard way, and he said, is there a more important topic? And I thought, yeah, 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 he's right. He's right. Because if, if, we, if we think for a moment, it's really the problem. Capital T, capital P. It's not, it's not the finance of the world, which will be, have a, ecology will have an impact, impact on the, the finances. But the provoking cause, I think, of many of our problems, certainly of this coronavirus, it's due to changing environmental policies. But, if the, the or story is true, this the man caught coronavirus from the bat he was eating, and he could eat the bat because now there are so many people that the environment of the bats is being invaded by people who are going to kill them and eat them, and coronavirus is the consequence of that. So if you if you play sort of a a Thomistic running the the, the syllogisms back. You can blame it on environmental degradation. So many of the things that we're going to face in the future are going to be the results of the environment. Italy is, is, is filled with environmental disasters. This country, you, you're at the tail end. You, I'm sure you'll catch up. But <laughs> the United States is filled with environmental disasters, the consequences which, of which will be paid by the children of the people who made them, the grandchildren. So I, I, I'm afraid that I'm probably going to end up as a crazy old lady in the corner screaming about the ecology. But uh, people, people come up and, and they tell me after some of these books, I didn't know. I didn't know. Well, most people don't know that in the Adriatic, no, not the, in the Mediterranean, off the coast of Calabria, the aerial photographs show the many, many sunken boats right off the coast, maybe 18, 18 miles off the coast. Many books were taken out, who knows by whom, 
and the pull the, they pulled the plug on and just let the boat sink filled with barrels of stuff. I've seen the photos. This is, this is common reported knowledge, and yet it comes as a surprise from the Italians. PFAS, the, the area in which the orchestra I work with rehearses, is a, is a rotary of the water zone because this PFAS, which is an industrial off, it's crap that comes out of processes with um, plastic, has polluted the aquifers in an area of a 17, there's a, a zone, there's a red zone where you can't drink the water because of the plastics. And so that was a Hanaford place in America, I think it's in Washington. That's filled with plastic. You can't drink the water for miles around that. And America is only now waking up fast. And it's estimated that there are hundreds of sites in the United States where this contamination has been going on and still is going on. So maybe, yeah, so maybe this is something that murder mysteries can do. At least make people say, that can't be true. That's not possible. Yes, it is. Okay, we're getting close to the end. Why don't you ask one question? Yes. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, the, uh, the film adaptations, I, I don't like them. Um, <laughs> you'll never know. <laughs> you don't yeah, want to hear me talk about them. The funny children. I think you need to talk about that one. Yeah, okay, so. <laughs> I have been an opera junkie for much of my life. I have pared it down to Baroque opera for about 10 years, maybe longer. I worked with Alan Curtis, the American Baroque conductor. Um, we recorded about 10 Handel operas. I fell in love with Alan one night at dinner. I, I had heard him conduct, but I had never met him, when he said, well, I think Handel is the greatest opera composer in the world, uh, ever. Very cool. So we put together the idea of, of recording a lot and performing a lot of Handel's operas. Alan died five years ago, and to leave him the legacy that is his of Il Compresso Barocco, two friends of mine and I, using many of the musicians from Il Compresso, a new opera, a new opera orchestra called a new orchestra called Il Pomo d'Oro. Il Pomo. Doro, the golden apple. Yeah. There is a 12-hour um, opera by Chesty that's never two two acts are missing, but they estimate it runs. <laughs> they estimate that um, it lasted 12 hours. It had three. It had a ballet for 300 horses. This is the, the ballet Il Pomodoro, and it's about Paris and the three goddesses. Because who would get the gold, the golden apple, the pomodoro? We've recorded four or five uh, handel operas. We've done a number of discs with Joyce Di Donato. Mm -hmm. In fact, this whole book tour, this whole thing for me of nine days, I agreed to do it because I blackmailed them into allowing me to go and see Joyce Di Donato sing Agrippina yes. at the Met on Sunday mm -hmm. because she recorded it with Il Pomodoro. And a year ago, I was at a week of rehearsal, a week of recording, and then I went like a camp follower and followed Joyce to four performances in concert. Because it's a, it's a glorious opera, you can buy it, um, uh, I don't forget who recorded it, with Joyce. The, the disc is fabulous. The, they have different singers. That's a non-judgmental comment. <laughs> they have different singers from the singers of the Met. They have, Joyce Di Donato, and if you're op an opera crazy, you're Baroque opera crazy, Joyce Di Donato and Franco Fagioli, and tell me where you're going to find two better singers, please. Anyway, that's my real, that's the thing I really get enthusiastic about. The books, the books. Yes, the day job. The books pay the rent. Well, they also pay the orchestra, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> details. Details. All right, okay. questions? So I think what we're going to do is We'll do some questions. I said because I have such a delicate little voice. Um, if we do questions, just wave your hand and um, give me a question. I'll repeat it so everyone can hear it on the dock. 
um, and that'll work. Yes. First of all, thank you very much for your books. They carry me to Venice every time I read them, and I love them. Good. Second of all, uh, I had another question. I wanted to know if you were involved in the film made by the by. No. I got that answer a while ago. <laughs> and my last question is, uh, can you elaborate on the fact that your books are not translated in Italian? Yeah. <laughs> can everyone hear? <laughs> yes. Okay, go for it. Okay, books are not translated, translated in Italian. Translated in Italian because I've, I've been in the music business for a long time and I've seen people get famous become famous over the course of years. Some are left alone by it. Some are not left alone by it. No one is made better by it. The lure of celebrity is, to some people, very attractive. And it doesn't do them any good. And so I, I prefer to live or spend a lot of time in a place where I am a nobody. Where people just don't, people don't defer. And, you're North Americans, so you can understand that kind of sensibility because it's, it's just bogus. So that's why. I, 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 I also think that if you were going to write about, and Don, Don says she writes as an Anglo Saxon in Italy, but anything you write about, what you really want to do is sit there in the cafe, carefully listening to what the people <laughs> <laughs> Writing a note to your mother, I think you said. <laughs> <laughs> and if everyone goes, oh, she's the writer. Yeah. You can't but, make yeah. those notes. That's true now, yeah. And I, I get a lot of stuff. I, I find I find a lot of stuff on the street. I read a lot of stuff in um, the Gazzettino or La Nuova Venezia that give a, a sense of, of things that happen. In fact, the, the, the story of the, the next book is one that I read in the Gazzettino a year and a half ago. And people people tell me stories. Mm -hmm. Or I chance upon stories and I think, oh my God, there's people. Because all I all I need, all I need is that much. Because I never know what a book is. I, I never know what's going to happen in a book. I really don't. I start the book and it goes ahead. And as with this book, Sometimes I get to a place where I don't, I, I don't like that anymore. I want to take it somewhere else. So, yeah, okay, let's try that. <laughs> the, the trick is to, to, to seal the seams. Yeah. Apart from your own books, uh, and giving a sense of uh, Venice, what book or books would you recommend that give a good sense of what Venice is like in the current day? The books about Venice. <laughs> I, I, I don't want this to sound like a wise ass answer, but I don't have to read a book about this. Oh, no, you I lived there for 30 years. So I, I haven't read many. No, no, no. I, can't think of, I can't think of any that I've, that I've read. Yeah, just, I have to leave, so I'm going to have to watch your answers on the tape. But, <laughs> um, while you were speaking, a couple of things occurred to me. I sort of wonder, do you read other mystery writers? And I don't know if one does that in your profession. And you made a comment about good families. I, I don't want to misquote you, but I've been reading um, J.K. Rowling's series. And she writes under the name of Peter Galbraith. Mm -hmm. And her protagonist does not come from a good family. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have a good situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, you know if you've ever read about mm -hmm. him. No. He, he's an Afghan war amputee. And he basically lives upstairs from his office. And he's very overweight. And he smokes a great deal and eats lots of junk food. Mm -hmm. and there's yeah. just oh, yeah, but that's a cliche. That I mean, has very much the noir tradition no, of the, the loner. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and and I'm very, very hesitant. I've I've not read this book. So I've never heard the name of the writer. But this is kind of upping the ante 
of how much of an outsider can I make my protagonist? Right. Take off a leg, make a, a jump through that, falls off the sofa, spit no foot. Come on. <laughs> how many people like this are, are you going to meet in the course of your life? I just, I just don't find that appealing, attractive. Why would I want to read about somebody like that? Actually, maybe we turn that to the other one with the other question. Oh, just what, what we read. Ross MacDonald. Lou Archer is one. If, if Guido Brunetti imitates anyone, it is Lou Archer in Ross MacDonald's novels. I think, and he's Canadian. I think Ross MacDonald is among the best crime writers ever. And his prose is lovely. I think Ruth Rendell is another person who writes like an angel, either as oh, in um, Judgment in Stone. Eunice Parchment killed the Coverdale family because she could not read That's or write. Right. First line. That's right. First line of the book. The that victim, book. no, the killer, the victim, and the mother. So that book has stuck with me for a number of years because of Love. the impact that illiteracy had on this poor woman. Or the, they, the, the morning they hanged my aunt, right. the, the dark attack that I that she wrote as Barbara yeah. Line. Yeah. She's so good. One more question. Come on, make it a good one, guys. Yes. I love Adams and I love one of the things I love about it is it's a human being people who are the same height as everyone else. You're very precise in um, when uh, Brunetti or anyone else is walking somewhere and you, you get all the, the little key turns right, went like down the highway, etc., which is lovely because I feel I'm walking mm -hmm. with them. Do you go and walk all these parts yourself <laughs> here exactly <laughs> where, you, where you're taking your protagonist? Either I, I remember them or I walk them. The first couple of books are all set in Caravaggio because of it was I was I didn't know what I was doing in terms of writing these books, so I just used my neighborhood because I I knew where to go left and where to go right and where the where the uh, the newsstand was. But now I will I will think about places where friends live or where I go to buy Amazon, uh, and then I always go if I if I don't have it really in my memory I will go back and check. So the, the geography is always correct. Except sometimes the stores change because one of the one of the curses of tourism is that so many for us useful shops get closed down because tourists don't want to buy needle and thread. <laughs> they don't want to buy <coughs> sensible underwear or uh, undershirts. So those close, those stores close up slowly, slowly, slowly. Every time I go back, I notice that certain places have closed. And, and more and more, to us, important places close, or historic places close. Stores that have been there for 70 years, poof, they're gone. And that's, that's one, one of the offshoots of mass tourism. Let me close with the happy numbers. There are currently, uh, forget the coronavirus, that there are no tourists, but up until now, the, there are 50, now, there are 50, 3,000 residents in Venice, 53,000. Last year, before the virus, there were 33 million tourists. So this is why Venetians get crazy. Just worth the numbers. 53,000, 33 million. But to give them the honor they, they deserve, still today, Venetians are friendly mm -hmm. and will stop and help you. If they see you, many of them, if they see you stuck, they can tell when people are hopelessly lost. <laughs> or if you stop and ask someone, how do I get to, they will, they will tell you, or very often, if they're old and they're Venetian, they will take you there. And in a city with this kind of disaster being wreaked upon them, the fact that they can do that and, and will do that, 
I think Spitz values the very humanity and the warmth. And I, I, I cannot praise him highly enough. But I feel, I, I feel that way about Italian. I'm just, I'm just dog off of them. Because they are so warm hearted and decent. Mm -hmm. And honest. Yeah, and honest. I find that. I've always found that. I've never been treated dishonest as honest. And the food! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all.